and above. Um, they have to be 16 up to the age of 65. And then they have to uh, have had a meal before they come in to donate. One has to be healthy. So what we do is we, we ask you if you have donated, if you're a repeat donor, we do a printout from there. If you're a first time donor, we give you a pamphlet um, about giving blood. So one has to first read and get the facts right. Uh, when they have read, uh, read the form, we do a printout on the, on, the, on the computer. When we do a printout, we check if the one has donated before. But well, some Madi may say they have not yet donated yet they have. So we get all the details from the computer. If of interest is anybody from the group donated blood before? No. Tried. You've tried. tried. You were told you were not donate blood. Yeah. I've got no hemoglobin. Yes. Yeah. For some reason, some might be able, we might not be able to donate. You said you have. Okay. Can I use your printout if you want for the people for the purposes of explaining if you want slides. So we ask you for details, in, uh, all the details, your address, your phone number, so that when we when you have to donate again, we can then call you using the the details. For the females, you don't uh, the females donate every four months, and then for the males, they donate every three months. Uh, so I'll show you. Did you manage? Okay. Okay. So this. This printout is for a repeat donor. As I said, Mr. Saina, one of our aides has donated before. So it all has all his information, his ID, um, residential address, the number of donations. You can see he said 119 donations, uh, email address, his weight. So we then ask the, uh, the donor to do the questionnaire. If he or she is not uh, quite quite familiar with other questions, we ask them to read so that we can do the, the questions in the screening room. And then it's, it's in two parts. There's also the back part as well. And then we ask them to sign. And then the, donor, uh, the, the nurse who does the history will also sign, will also put the signature and the date of donation. And then we go into the screening room. Excuse me, I'm seeing. Okay, when the donor comes in, we close the door for privacy. Once we ask about anything, even your sexual history, we have to know for the blood to be safe. So we do the weight. As I said before, one has to weigh 50 kgs and above. And then when we have done the weight, we ask the donor to sit. The donor sits there. And then uh, the nurse sits there. We do what is called, we, we then uh, go over the form again to check on the questions. And then like, uh, for instance, if the donor says like, let's go to part two, uh, rheumatic fever, chest pain, heart disease, lung disease, tuberculosis, uh, or asthma. If like, if the donor has had these, any of these, we then refer to what is called our medical guideline. It has all the information, all the, uh, uh, the diseases, if immunizations, um, like um, even uh, it offers, it has information on like common medications. We use this. So uh, the information we use here is standard. Even if you go to Motari, even if you go to Gweru, even you, if you go to Mashingo, our different codes are all the same. So we refer to this book, but we know them offhand. Like if you say you have had some uh, common codes, we defer you for one week and then you can come back afterwards. Blood pressure, using our blood pressure machine. If your BP is high or if, it, or if, or if it's too low, you can donate. So if everything is well, we then proceed to the donation area.
right? So if one is subjected to antibiotic in, in, in traces, it means when they get sick and they, they get that antibiotic, it means they will be resistant to that antibiotic. And also on the uh, donor's part, if they donate when they are on an antibiotic, it means we are taking that antibiotic from him or her. So it means you won't get better. So it, it's, uh, when you're an antibiotic, you cannot donate. We ask you to stop for one week and then you can donate after one week. Uh, uh, normally when there is some tooth extraction, there is some bleeding that occurs. So when the bleeding, when you bleed, it means your circulating volume will be low, so you can donate as well. This person here, right? And then when we sit here, we do what is pre, we do what is pre-donation counseling. We ask them if you do, on, if you go on the back part of this form, they say there is a question that says, do you consider your blood to be safe? To donate blood to be transfused to a patient so if your quest your answer is no we ask you why so if you you are hiv positive we then defer you permanently you can't come at any time to donate because it's unethical we don't take blood that infected to give to the patients in hospital so those who are hiv positive they can't donate blood Or they lie. He, um, you, as a counselor, I think you can get it. You can pick out something. Um, if you pick out something from the donor, you can just say to the donor nicely, can you please go for, for counseling and testing? So if their results come out well, they can always come back and donate. But if they don't, they don't. So if in the event that you failed to pick out something, the person was HIV positive. Okay, all the blood that we take from here is screened. No matter how many times you have donated, we screen the blood. You have seen the form for Mr. Saira. He has donated 119 times. Each time the blood is taken, it's tested in the lab. But it's not for us, just not, not just to take blood. We are more say no. It's like we screen. If we find that there is something wrong with your history, we say no, can you go and get tested and then come back. But we always speak. And then if we find that the donor is HIV positive, <coughs> or if the donor is, um, was, if you read on the form of the declaration there, uh, we, there is, we test for the TTIs, that is HIV, we call them transfusion, transmittable infections, HIV, syphilis, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. So if we find that the donor is HIV positive, we ask them to come in for counseling. That's why we ask for all uh, your, your phone number. Where is Mr. Saira's phone? There. Okay. So what we do basically is when we, we you, you get to know it when you are there. When we, the donor is eligible to donate, when the donor donates, they, they will put a barcode. So we don't identify a donor by name. We identify them by barcodes for the purposes of care confidentiality. So when the donor tests positive, we then contact the donor, we ask them to come for counseling. We don't write on the letter that you are HIV positive, no. And to sit there, they are very comfortable chairs. One can elevate. So the nurse here prepares the pack. These are the blood packs. Okay, this is a blood pack, so we put a dead stamp for like for Mr. Saira, we know his blood type, so we're going to put the, the sticker, his blood type is all positive, we we'll put the sticker there, and then we put the, we put the, the, the date on the pack, and then we ask the donor to sit, who wants to sit? <laughs> okay. So that's how the donor sits. You can expose this part. 
so that I can just do some demonstration. So this is Misty Saira, our donor. We identified the donor by using the name. And then we put the... <laughs> so we tie so that the vein comes out like that. We give them a stress ball. This helps in the pumping of blood. Okay. Area to remove any pathogens and then we prick. And then the process should take about 10 to 15 minutes. So, okay, that's what you'll be doing when he's donating blood. And then when he when he's finished, we remove this, and then we discard the the sharps, this needle. So this needle is just used once. We then put it in our sharp box, and then we we tie the blood together there's something there so this is the blood that Mr. Saira is donated so we also collect some samples as I said before we test for infections right so this one is for TTIs the ones that I said sorry what are the TTIs yeah this is for the TTIs and the other one is for blood group. So each time you donate, we take these two samples. So they will be tested in the lab. So about this, you will hear in the lab, they will explain further. And then we tie them together like this. So we all in, right? Um, so what happens is, this is the, the dispatch section, right? way of blood that is donated, it passes through this section. So it's unfortunate that the time you came in, my colleagues have just finished processing all the blood that was collected from this. Right? I'm sure from the clinic side, it was explained to you that we have uh, donors who walk in, and we also have mobile vehicles which goes out wherever there is a plant, a blood site. So, like right now, they are please taking place outside. And uh, later in the day, that blood comes. So when it comes back now, we start by entering it into our system, right? Maybe I can ask my colleague, the supervisor of this section, Mr. James, to briefly just explain what happens when the blood comes in, into the system. That's so, <coughs> Yeah, when blood comes into the system, um, each, each, each pack comes with two barcode numbers, with, with two specimens with uh, barcode numbers. So we use the computer to check that the pack number on the, on the blood pack tallies with the uh, numbers on the two specimen tubes. We use what we call the bar barcode verification system. And after that, we weigh the uh, blood packs just to monitor the correct proportion of anticoagulant to whole blood. Then we just capture the statistics and move over the blood to the next laboratory for component preparation. So basically, this is what happens in, the, in right. terms of processing. We also store and distribute the um, blood and blood components which, are, which have been cleared for, for, for distribution. So we receive, store, and distribute blood and blood components. So in a nutshell, Maybe. Yeah, so, ca customers <coughs> customers come in with um, with authentic orders, like um, government hospitals come in with uh, government requisitions stamped and authorized. <coughs> then the, the private hospitals come in with their order forms. So we, when they, they, the the messengers come in, we capture the um, the requirements. Okay, the blood and blood uh, product requirements, including those uh, products that we may not be able to supply, because that also helps helps us to monitor uh, our demand and supply statistics. Okay, if we are unable to supply, we also need that information that we we had a, def a supply deficit of so much so that we can improve our systems. 
Then after that, we will retrieve the blood and blood products from storage facilities. Then we uh, produce a delivery note, okay? We capture the donation numbers in the system, of course, and then produce a delivery note. Uh, in fact, we produce three delivery notes, one for accounts, one for the customer, and the other for our records. And then when we, when we distribute the blood and blood products, we also maintain what's called the cold chain, because we, 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 we don't just transport blood at room temperature. So if there are frozen products, we, we add uh, ice packs in the transportation boxes. And if there are cellular products, we also maintain the transportation temperature of blood between 2 and 10 degrees Celsius. So we make sure that when blood and blood product, products are in transit, they are refrigerated and we observe the transit temperatures while distributing the blood. So, so what is critical is the traffic of blood is two-way, in and out. So in for processing. So when blood comes, when blood is donated, right, it gets into the system and it gets into the process value chain. It has to be processed, it has to be tested. So it's not um, a matter of getting blood from hair as a blood donor and then taking it to hair as the recipient. But there's a lot that happens in between, which, which, is, which, is, which is what we are trying to summarize in these 30 minutes. But there's a lot that is involved, and I think you're having the visuals. So why I'm opening this up is for you to actually see the blood, right? So that's, that blood which you see here, it's ready for distribution. So this is now the way out. Like he was talking of official, um, what do you call it? Offic official authentic order. So when that order comes now, this is the stock that is available for distribution. And I think what is important as media people is to, so that you know, uh, when you're dealing with blood, you're dealing with a highly perishable product, right? What we mean by that is it's, 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 it, 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 it is a finite shelf life. You can't have, you can't say, let's collect blood today and use in June. So red blood cells, depending on the uh, preservative solution that you are using, the longest that you can have is 42 days from the day of collection. So you have to play balancing act of what you collect and what you distribute so that there is enough blood. So what is important is we work with what is called uh, days, stock days supply of blood. We work with how many days stock supply do you have for, for, for sufficient. Because you can't you can't hoard, if I'm to use that, you can't hoard blood in anticipation for use in an in, in unknown future. You have to plan in such a way that it's, it, you have to use it within uh, its viable or lifespan. So red cells, the longest is 42 days. The shortest could be 20 days, right? 20 day, 21 days, depending on the anticoagulant solution you are using to preserve it. Then other products, it's even shorter. We have products which expires in five days. So you have to use it in five days, like the platelets you was talking about. So, so this is the storage. And what is important is cold chain. We are talking of cold chain. Uh, so this is the unit of blood, right? By blood type. And uh, you have to store this unit uh, in a temperature range of 2 degrees Celsius to 6 degrees Celsius until it's used. Right? So, so I thought, I, thought I, sh I should emphasize this. So this, this is a cold room which needs to be maintained in the right temperature all the time. Otherwise, it can be affected. You will notice that it's quarantine. Quarantine, we have particular technology like every other field. We have particular technology that we use, uh, which, which, mean, uh, which, which mean a lot in how we do our processes. There it's available cold room, meaning it's the stock. It has been processed, it has been tested, 
and it's ready for distribution, for patient transfusion, right? Then quarantine, like stop here. Let's give everyone anything. But you have to give the patient what exactly is required. So processing now helps us to prepare or to produce or to manufacture those particular products, with those particular products. So that when the doctor says there's a patient with bleeding disorders requiring platelets, platelets are small uh, granules, well, you'll be able to see here. So if the patient at the hospital has a bleeding problem, <coughs> which requires platelets, not necessarily red blood cells, so, so the doctor requests that, then we supply the platelet. And when the platelet is supplied, is transfused, it then corrects the problem. So, so, so I wanted to emphasize the issue of cold chain. So this blood is still in process, meaning it's still being tested. Results are not yet in this, are not yet assigned to the blood common, to the blood donated and its various components. It also means we haven't finished our labeling, right? It also means we haven't done our quality checks to say this is safe for transfusion. So, 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 this is the storage. So, the distinct storage units are critical so that we minimize chances of mistakes, chances of issuing out or distributing blood, which should not be distributed. Hence, these separate and distinct storage facilities. So, <coughs> it's a rushed and compressed visit. We are all in, right? So, say, you asked about processing, right? What is processing? So, this is the processing layer. And uh, this is processing in taking place. Maybe Mr. Wafa, okay. I think he is the supervisor for this section. Maybe you can come over here and uh, briefly, uh, briefly answer the question which I was asked on processing. My response was wait and come. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to National Blood Service and to component section in particular. This is what we call the component section where we do process uh, the whole blood into different components. So uh, the Blood, I think you started from the clinic and uh, you saw that the, uh, the, the whole blood is bled and it's bled in this triple pack. So this is the primary pack where uh, before it's, 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 uh, it's filled in with blood, there is anticoagulant to avoid the blood to clot. Right? Right, so when that is done, then the blood comes in through dispatch. Dispatch do what they do, and then it comes through to us. Our mandate here is to uh, separate or fractionate this raw blood into uh, mainly uh, four components. We do pet cells, we do uh, the fresh frozen plasma, we do cryoprecipitate, we also do uh, platelets, and yes, we can also do the whole blood as is, as, as is right? There are uh, conditions which require whole blood, uh, so we don't fractionate it, we just keep it, keep can, it as it can is. Can I explain? Yes. Those few conditions. Yes. The use of whole blood is now discouraged. Yes. Is standard practice in treating patients. Why? Because it might not address the issue. But there are few cases where raw blood has to be used. The most popular one is exchange transfusion. Like in where mothers who give baby, babies who are jaundiced, or jaundice is a liver disease where the, 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 the red blood cells for a newly born child. Uh, uh, there will be a conflict of fighting with the, the mother cells. So, so the doctors would uh, conduct a, a, a procedure or a process in the hospital 
to correct that, which is called exchange transfusion, which is more like taking out the blood of a child and infusing fresh, fresh, it has to be fresh. fresh. By fresh, we mean the blood has to be within five days from the day, day of donation. So there are those few cases and other few, very few cases. The use of warm blood, I think, is less than 1% global and even here. So I just thought I needed to explain that before you the process the components. Okay, so I was... Uh, I asked to bring the platelet so that they can help you. So I was talking about the components we we, 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 <coughs> we derive out of the whole blood. So I said we do the pet cell, right? We do the FFP. We, the which we saw in that room, right? in that courtroom space. Right, yeah. <coughs> the fresh frozen plasma. <coughs> uh, Fresh frozen plasma, right? I think you you you, you came across it somewhere. No, eh? no, 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 no. Span, oh. span. Can you get into one one FFP? FFP. Okay. So, right, and then we do uh, the platelet. This, like this, this is, this the, is platelet. the platelet, and then we do the cryo precipitate. The most delicate and special product in our. <laughs> In our process value chain. Okay. This is the first day show of life. Yeah. So with the PEG cell, uh, it, the shelf life is 42 days, which is six weeks. With the FFP, because it's frozen, fresh frozen, is the shelf life is one year, 12 months. Same applies to the cryo precipitate. It's also frozen, and uh, the shelf life is, is 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 one year as well. So, how do we fractionate or how do we separate the uh, FFPs, the cryoprecipitate, the platelet from the whole blood? Because we said our, our process starts with a whole blood. This is the whole blood. And we are saying the platelet comes from the whole blood. The FFP comes from the whole blood. The cryoprecipitate uh, as well comes from the whole blood. So how do we do that? We do that by uh, what we call centrifugation. We centrifuge the FFP, I mean the whole blood, uh, and uh, we take advantage of the speed of the, uh, the, the cent centrifugation, the time, the temperature uh, is also a factor, depending on what product we are making. For example, if we are doing platelets, Platelets are kept at, at, at ambient temperature. Uh, I can say at room temperature. Some people would like to call it room temperature. Uh, at uh, 22 minus 1 is 22 minus 2 degrees. That's where we keep, that's the, 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 the optimum temperature for keeping the platelet. And then this is the FFP. Right, as you can see, it's frozen uh, and it's kept at below minus 20. Uh, I think he was going to show you around where we keep our, our FFPs. So, like I was saying, how do we fractionate or separate FFP, platelet, whatever I have said, from the whole blood? I was talking of centrifugation. So, behind you there, maybe you need to see. Uh, behind you, we, I can lead to centrifuges, and this is what we call a centrifuge, right? So, a centrifuge is a chamber, right, which has got these compartments, and what we do, we balance our whole blood here in these in this buckets, and then when they are balanced, we slot in them, we slot them in there, right? Depending on the product we are doing, like I said, uh, the PEG cell, the FFP, we do uh, spin them at, I talked about the temperature, at 4 degrees. As you can see, uh, the temperature here is 3 degrees. At 4, plus or minus 1 degrees. And you can feel the, 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 the chamber here, it's cold. Can I without feel? You can feel almost so, so, if we centrifuge this one, 
that's the technical name. We can call it finning, but it's, the technical name is centrifugation. So if we centrifuge the, 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 the whole blood, it then separates. Why, how does it separate? It's simple, it's, it's simple density. Cells are denser than plasma, right? Like in this case, density so we take advantage of the density huh? so the cells are denser than the plasma so when we centrifuge what happens is the cells will sediment down and the plasma will be suspended above the cells and when that is done we then separate the plasma from the cells right and uh, we have a new technology which is just behind you there, right? So we use those, we, we call those Archmed uh, separators. Then we use those to separate this, the plasma from the cells. So we end up with a plasma, right? And unfortunately, we don't have one. Well, I think we have one there, I'll show you there and the cells, which are now separated. So, if we are to do platelets, we then harvest the plasma from the cells, and we make sure, that because the cells, remember I talked about speed, temperature, and, yeah, speed and temperature. So, when we are doing platelets, we, 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 we spin at a low uh, speed, so that the, the cells don't sink into the cells. We want to harvest the buffy coat. So it's like the cells are just above the, 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 I mean the platelets are just above the cells in what we call a buffy coat, where we are saying maybe there are white cells in there and the platelets. And then we harvest that buffy coat. And then we do another spin for the buffy coat to harvest the platelet now of which you can see in there. Those are the platelets. Yeah. Again, we have taken advantage of uh, density because the platelets are denser than the plasma, so they will sediment down, and then after that, we just separate the plasma out and leave about, about 980 to 100 mils of plasma just to, 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 to suspend the, 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 the platelets. Yeah. Okay. Right? So I so, think. See, you know, for this, these centrifuges, they are high cost material mm -hmm. for us to be able to do this. So, so, so this, is, this, this is something that, that is not apparent. It's hidden. You probably got to know about it because you come here. Behind you is just a recently yeah, is received centrifuge. A recently acquired. Recently acquired. That's that right. Where did you acquire them from? Unfortunately, this, 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 all these that you are seeing, there is no place in Africa, including South Africa, which prepares this. So, mostly it's Europe and the USA. So, so the and the cost then become very significant. So I thought I should drop in the cost issue in terms of equipment. If you come here. Okay. You are talking about talk about storage of the platelets, yes, the platelets. and that instrument. Yes, that is. This is what we call the agitator. Okay. Like uh, you are saying, we want to keep the platelet viable, right? So, for we we don't want it to, because platelets have got a tendency of aggregating. Say, like in in simple terms, I can say. Uh, clamping and it is yes, clamping. clamping, but we the, the technical name is aggregation. It aggregates so no platelet, no baraumba and that. So we want to keep it in liquid form. That's why we say to no see that 80 to 100 mils to suspend the platelet, and then we keep it agitating. What you say to say? It's an aggregate, cannot it's a clamp. So this is how we keep our platelet at that temperature. I talked I talked about. 
22 plus or minus 2, as you can see, is 20, it's 21.3. And we, 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 we monitor these temperatures religiously. Religiously. So, as you can see, if you check here, we've got a temperature, daily temperature record, where we, we take the temperature at 8 o'clock, we also take at 2 o'clock, at, five, at 1700 hours and 12 midnight because we are we operate 24 hours the laboratory operates 24 hours so there's someone who actually come and take the temperature at midnight so we 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 we, we, we monitor these temperatures religiously like I, I said and you can see that could be, uh, we we monitor them at those times and uh, we keep the platelet agitating to have to, to prevent aggregation, like I said. And here, Tower and suspension. This piece of equipment here, you see at Yabu Zokamashure, is where we separate the platelet, the plasma. We are not separating the plasma to see our platelets are papa. Like I was saying. There we are, there is the platelet, there is the plasma which is suspending the, the platelet. And it, so this machine is set uh, such that uh, we, it uses distance. And it, it's, it's configured in, in such a way that can I press enough, uh, enough plasma the, 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 the distance here, you know, see, is in a at least 80 to 100 mils. Yeah. And it, so this is where we separate our platelets. Yes, it was sense that they are auto automatic plasma separators. separators. Right. Why automatic? Because technology is moving, it's evolving. And uh, when, you, when you automate, you tend to produce high quality products for patient administration. That is opposed to manual processing. So, we already have the instruments, right? Though we require more and automate all our processing so that the quality expectations of each and every product are according to minimum requirements. So this is what you get in, in Europe, this is what you get in the USA, in, in as blood services, they in trying to ensure quality of end products. So I thought I should emphasize that to you. And also, it's a source of huge cost because it costs money. And one thing I also want to emphasize is the need for power. We require. You, you can see the processes. The platelets they need to continue dancing until they get to the patient. If they stop dancing they start to aggregate like you are saying. And when they aggregate, you may not see it with your naked eye. When they aggregate, you are a patient now and you are receiving that product. If it's aggregated, it won't be, the term is, it won't be efficacious to address the problem. Because platelets, their role in our bodies is when you have a cut, if you have not, next time you have a cut, just observe what happens before you clean out. If you look closely, you see something like water, right? Before blood. If it is a small cut, observe it. Even when your kid or if just take time to observe what's happening on that cut. You see something like water there. And before time, you begin to see a, a, your blood clumping or getting a, a clotting. And when it is clotting, it's the system, natural system of plugging that that head. But if you have a, if you have a, a, a deficiency of the, the platelets he was talking about, blood will keep coming. You keep coming. You keep coming, coming out and you lose the blood. So where do we need platelets mostly? We need platelets mostly for maternal cases. Mothers in hospitals, uh, they lose a lot of blood. I, no, I, no more delivery, you lose, mothers lose blood. In cesarean sections, mothers lose blood. Accidents, people lose blood. So if we don't correct that, we can lose the patient. So this is where platelets come in now. This is machine here. She's top of 
what can I say? If we talk of if we talk of the most critical lab probably in the country, mm -hmm. if you ask me as a lab scientist or as a medical practitioner, I'll tell you it's this. Mm -hmm. Why? It's because this is where we test all the blood donated in this country. So all the, uh, this whole big lab is called Donations Testing Laboratory. But this section, so in the Donations Testing Laboratory, two critical things take place, um, which is transfusion, transmissible infectious screening. Which is HIV, which is the most notorious. HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis, yeah, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and syphilis, right? So this is what happens in this section, right? Our 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 legs, I can say she is. I wanted to speak, but anyway. So 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 this is the. Transfusion, transmissible infection section of the test donations testing lab. What does that mean? It means all the blood that you saw, I don't know if you managed to see anyone donating. Okay, it is asked, I usually ask this person before I take over a tour. Transfusion, trans, transfusion, transmissible infections testing. When you, when you donate it, when you donate it, they collected specimen tubes, right? Maybe if you remember, two two tubes. So the two tubes or two samples after the process, one <coughs> then came in for testing for those four markers according to WHO for one HIV type one and type two, hepatitis B test for the surface antigen. Right? But I to see antibodies and syphilis. Why testing this? We tested this because these are infections or diseases which can be passed on from her to me as a recipient. So for blood surface to guarantee it, we have to perform the test to make sure that the blood is safe before we pass it on. Again, I'm answering your question. What do you mean by this? So, 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 blood is not just moving from me to you, but it's going through this process of advantage. So now, the specifics. This, this is the... So we receive volumes and volumes of samples on a daily basis. Something of 500 to 1,000 on a daily basis. We're talking about nearly 100,000 samples a day. That's, that's, that's not small. So testing has to be accurate. It has to be on point. Otherwise, the blood, when it goes out, it can infect something. So currently, we're using, initially, we're using this, this analyzer, these two analyzers. This is an upward system. Wait, there's somewhere you can upward. Same. Output. Then also here, up. so these are output acted analyzers. They are specifically for performing this test I'm talking about. Now these are manufactured in the US and Germany. No African country does this. We don't do any of this. So even the reagents that you do, see she's busy loading the machine. This is the latest acquisition that we have. We got this last year, right? We got this last year. And I think we will, what can maybe fit. But what I know is we put this ahead of South Africa, the latest technology for screening uh, 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 infectious diseases. It's manufactured in the US, and sometime in July last year, it was approved by the Food and Drug Administration of the US to say this analyzer is safe for screening blood. So we already have it. So what it means is, it speaks to surface of our blood and blood commons. We're using the systems, the technology, 
you're running away now. Yeah. Yeah. The technology that you find in Europe, that you find in the US. So now that is a big story, a big statement as far as Zim blood safety is concerned. I always tell people, I'm the blood safety uh, 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 manager, I'm a scientist, and when I need to be transfused, when I need to see my wife, my children, whoever, I'm just go to the next facility where that can be at least without thinking about it. So that's that is the assuring and the guarantee that I give people about how safe can I take it? So you can take it, it must be said that. So this is the test. Are there any questions? It is that specific. So this is the analysis that I take equipment um, manufactured in the US to do blood type. And there are eight, there are four main blood groups, which is O, which is the majority. There is A, there's B, there's A B. So it's A B positive. B positive. The positive is a sub system for dressers. Right? So when you get blood, you should get according to your blood group and dressers so that it's compatible. Even if the blood is safe from the TTI infection, if it's not correct group, it can kill a recipient within 15 minutes. Yes, it can kill you within 15 minutes. So, so, it, it, so we ensure that we are assigning correct blood groups to the donors. So that when the patient needs blood, they get the correct blood. Again, we're talking of high costs and, and stuff. I think let's move to the last section. What you have done um, is part of the blood service, global blood service. Is now we know what we know about corona is it takes it has 14 day incubation period. Right? That is what is known scientifically. So what we have done as for blood services is to take precautionary measures to say if someone has been to the hot spots of such countries where there is an endemic uh, a, 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 a case of corona, and if you're a blood donor, if you want, so it becomes an index case to say have you been to those countries where there are cases of corona? If yes, then uh, and you want to give blood. What blood services have done is to double the incubation time to 20 days. So we would have to defer you for 20 days before you give blood. Because by that time, we also know that the coronavirus cannot survive um, uh, under harsh conditions. It, it cannot then start to manifest after 20, those 28 days. So, so, so that is the measure that is. Unless, okay, so this is the compatibility <coughs> department. Basically, it's just uh, about compatibility. We're just checking if a product is compatible to a patient. Our product. So we find out that uh, this department is not concerned about blood production. It's all about blood utilization. So basically, we do the grouping, the ABO system, to check uh, the ABO group of that patient. Then we look for an identical a blood group a product. Is that okay? So if you are a blood group O positive, we look for a product that is O positive. And then do the compatibility tests, tests to determine if uh, that product is compatible for that patient. What we do here, compatibility department. Then our clients, they are mostly private practitioners, private hospitals, doctors' rooms. Those, those clinicians, they don't have um, equipment to do the lab tests, so we do a uh, compatibility test for them. So we work with days of supply, right? And we monitor this on a daily basis to say, okay, we have what we call a blood bank statement, right? Where we have to look at our, our our stocks. We also have, uh, I didn't talk about it, an ICT system. Was, how can you manage this whole system manually? It's complicated. But we have 
what we call a laboratory information system, which is current and which looks at managing the donor process, protesting and uh, storage and distribution. So it tells us stock supply. So from the lab, we have to know how many stocks of blood do we need for each particular blood, blood group, even for bloodless. So when we see, we match that with the demand, and then we distribute. So, so that is very key and very important for country sufficiency. If there is low stocks in the system, we trigger the system. Guys, recruitment and collection team, can you up your game? So probably that's where we will then require services of the, in the media people to say the public should be encouraged to donate blood. WHO guides that at least 10 in every 1,000 population should be blood donors for that country to have sufficient. So blood comes from people. And our major misgiving, what we have noted, is the adults, people like us, who are the most consumer of this, this product, because we are aging, we are sick, we are the most defaulting people to donate. So I think that is also one good message that can go out to encourage all healthy people to give blood. Ask yourself, if you are healthy, why have you not? She has tried. But if you haven't tried, why? What's stopping you? Because you never know. It could be you who require that blood tomorrow or you close the letter. So I think, so it's also what we do to make sure we monitor stocks and, and trigger what, what has to happen for the system to continue operating. Do you have any questions?